In addition to our reading from 1 Samuel chapter 16, hear these words from the Apostle Paul written to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 28. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, for you and you alone are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Matthew 5, chapter 8 tells us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And again, 1 Samuel chapter 16 tells us the Lord God looks upon our hearts. So this relationship that we have with the Lord God seems to be a reciprocal love relationship. Love that goes around seems to be love that comes around. I've been blessed to hear Tony Campolo share this story several times. When Jean Thompson stood in the front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school in the fall, she looked at her pupils and she said that she loved them all the same, that she would treat them all alike. Yet that was impossible because in front of her, slumped in his seat on the third row, was a boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play very well with the other children, that his clothes were unkempt, and that he constantly seemed to need a bath. To add to it, Teddy was unpleasant, unlikable, and unteachable. As the school year went by, it got to the point that she would actually take delight in marking up his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's and then a big giant F at the top. And the classmates who had called this sullen little boy a, a zero were not far off. Nobody enjoyed being around Teddy Stoddard. Now, like most teachers, Mrs. Thompson was required to review the records of each child throughout the year, and because of her general dislike for him, she put Teddy's review last. But when she opened his file, she was in for quite the surprise. His first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright, inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly. He has good manners. Teddy is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, is well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a very serious illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy continues to work hard, but his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his, his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps are not taken. And Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn, shows no interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes he sleeps in class. He is tardy and he is becoming a problem. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem, but Christmas was coming fast. She wanted to, to reach out to Teddy, but it was all that she could do with the school play and all to get her work done until the day before the holidays began. And on that day, her students brought her presents all in satin ribbon and bright paper except for Teddy's, which was clumsily wrapped in the heavy brown paper of a cut-up grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to, to open Teddy's gift in the middle of the other presents. And some of the other children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing. 
and a bottle of perfume that was half empty. But she stifled the laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was putting it on. And then she dabbed some perfume behind her other wrist. At the end of the day, Teddy Stoddard stayed behind just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, you know, that was, that was my mom's bracelet and that was her perfume. And today you smell just like my mom used to. As soon as Teddy left, Mrs. Thompson sat at her desk and cried for at least an hour. But from that day on, Jean Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. And as she worked with him, his mind came alive. And the more she encouraged him, the faster that he responded. And on those days of big tests, Mrs. Thompson would always remember to dab on some of that perfume. And by the end of the year, he had become one of the brightest children in the class. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that of all the teachers that he'd had in elementary school, she was his favorite. Six years later, she got another note from Teddy. And then he wrote that as he finished high school, third in his class, she was still his favorite teacher of all time. And four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd, he had stayed at school, he had stuck with it, and he would graduate from college with highest honors. But he assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still his favorite teacher. And then four more years passed, and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still his favorite teacher, but now his... His name was just a little bit longer, and the letter was signed, Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. But the story, it doesn't end there. There was yet another letter that spring. Teddy wrote that, well, he'd met this girl, and he was going to be married. He explained that his father had, had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering, well, if, if Miss Thompson might agree to sit in the pew, reserved, for the mother of the groom. As she sat in that pew, watching Teddy, who once was lost and alienated and alone, who was unpleasant, unlikable, and unteachable, get married, Jean Thompson was overwhelmed by this great biblical truth. What goes around comes around. Love one another includes troublesome fifth graders as well. You know, most people, I think, overlook a person's heart when it's buried under pain or some other burden. The first part, part A of 1 Corinthians 13, 12, reminds us that for now, our vision is impaired. Eugene Peterson's message translation says, we don't see things clearly. We, we're squinting in a fog. We're peering through the mist. And it has been shared already this morning, we tend to too often look at the outward appearance, how a, how a person dresses, how they respond, how clean or how unclean they might be. And too often we act like the cute shall inherit the earth. And scripture tells us God has a different perspective. We look at the outward appearance, but the Lord God goes deeper. The Lord looks at the heart. Our primary scripture for today is 1 Samuel 16 from the Old Testament. The people of Israel are looking for a new king, and they don't even know it yet. They still have a king, the very first king, Saul, son of Kish. But the Lord God has looked into the heart of King Saul, and God does not like what God sees. And he charges the prophet Samuel to find a new king. Now, the Hebrews didn't always have a king. They had God. But for many in Israel, God was not enough. And all the neighboring countries had kings and palaces and royal weddings and royal births and all that glitzy royalty stuff. You know, I believe people are still really into all that glitzy royalty stuff. Six years ago, my wife Linda, who like me is a commoner, joined me for an intimate VIP tour of Buckingham Palace in London along with about 900 other very important people. 
But they had an exhibit of the attire worn by the wedding party during Prince William and Kate Middleton's wedding. Prince William's shoes, made by the great English shoemaker Peel and Company, makers of fine boots and shoes since 1565 were on display. 1565. If you're a UK football fan, you may remember that was the last year UK beat Florida. <laughs> Sorry. The listed value of those shoes was 2,500 pounds, about $4,000 in, in American money. I don't know about you guys, but I have never owned a $4,000 pair of shoes. One room, a much bigger room, was dedicated to Kate's wedding dress. It was in the center of the room. It was enclosed by glass with multi-level theater seating all around, and the room was absolutely packed. An attendant told me that, that one lady had been there all day, every day, for a week staring at Kate's dress. Apparently, royalty is fascinating, but Israel had none of that. All Israel had was sort of a special deal, a covenant, if you will, with the great God of creation. And Genesis chapter 15 tells us that God had struck a deal with Abraham centuries earlier to make the Hebrew people special, to make them a, a model group for all the world to see. And that, of course, was very nice, but but they wanted more. They wanted what the neighboring countries had. They literally had it all, but they wanted to be like everyone else. And what they got turned out to be less, much less. They got a king. And while a young adult named Saul was out searching for his father's donkeys, he, he bumped into the prophet Samuel, and God told Samuel that for now, Saul was the one. Saul certainly looked the part. He had the appearance of royalty. He was from the tiny tribe of Benjamin, which would not get the competing larger tribes upset. It's possible that he was already wearing sandals made by Peel and company. Saul, Saul, you demand. Saul got off to a good start. To use a basketball analogy, he was leading by eight midway through the first half, and then the wheels fell off. He got caught up in his own importance. The name on the back of his jersey became more important to him than the name on the front. And before you could say one and done, he was toast. And Samuel 15, 35 tells us the Lord regretted that he had ever made Saul king over Israel. In the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, we discover the Lord God has a new candidate in mind. And this time, it's one of the sons of Jesse over in the little village of Bethlehem. So Samuel heads to Bethlehem where he meets up with Jesse, but Jesse has multiple sons. Which one will be king? As soon as he encounters Jesse's sons, Eliab, the, the oldest, clearly stands out. He looks like a king in every way. Kate Middleton would really go for somebody like that. This must be the one. Long live King Eliab. But God has someone else in mind. And verse 6 picks up the narrative. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But au contraire, Samuel, because verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And then in rapid succession, Jesse had seven of his sons, each one a, a McDonald's All-American, passed by Samuel, and God has the audacity to reject all of them. So who's next? That's it for Jesse's boys. But wait, there, there is one more. There's little David, the youngest son, the one off stage, the one who's tending the sheep. Go get him, says Samuel, and get a move on, because we're not going to sit down until you get back. And then beginning with verse 12, we read, So he sent for him and had him brought in, and he was glowing with health and had a, a fine appearance, handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So the people's choice, Saul, 
in God's own time will be supplanted by God's choice, David. In this narrative, the choosing of David is contrasted with that of Saul. Saul was outstandingly impressive. David was a virtual non-entity in the Jesse family. He was the one left behind to tend the sheep while his seven brothers were off being presented to Samuel at the festivities over in Bethlehem. And the, the, the contrasting part here is further emphasized in the rejection of Eliab, who, like Saul, had all the appearances of being first-class leadership material. And the narrative tension builds as the seven sons are, are one by one presented to Samuel, only to be turned down. Are all your sons here? It apparently never occurred to Jesse that David, the, the little brother, was good for anything other than menial farm work. And the choice of David, the most unlikely of the brothers, perhaps even the family runt, has, has entered our Christian imagination as a characteristic of the Lord God's electing grace. And Paul's way of putting it in 1 Corinthians 1.28 was God chose what was low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. We read the Spirit of the Lord came on David on the occasion of his anointing. And it was God working in David's life. That's God at work in David's muscles, in his body, and in his mind. And spirit in Hebrew and in the Greek has the basic meaning of, of breath or of wind, the invisible that moves through the visible. And this idea of the Spirit of God present and at work in men and women should keep us continually alert to the working of the God whom we cannot see in the people and in the events which we do see. The world today is full of would-be kings, the rich, the famous, the glamorous, the gifted, the opportunistic. But the world today is also quite full of, of Teddy Stoddards, of people who need someone to look past the, the superficial outer layer, the wrappings, if you will, to see the potential that the Lord God has placed in their hearts. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells his followers, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. We need to see as Jesus sees. We need to hear as Jesus hears. We need to love as Jesus loves. We need to be just a bit more like Mrs. Thompson. History remembers a little boy, very much like Teddy Stoddard. When he was seven, his family was forced out of their home. He had to work to support them. Two years later, his mother died. His father was mean and disinterested. He was considered to be sort of an oddball as a youth, had few friends and failed in his first attempt in business. Out of work, he decided to run for the state legislature and lost. He then tried to get in law school, but was rejected. Then he borrowed some money from a friend to begin another business, and by the end of the year was bankrupt. He spent the next 17 years of his life paying off the debt. And then he ran for state legislature, and due to a very poor opponent, actually won, and flushed with success, he got engaged, and then his sweetheart died. Then he had a total nervous breakdown and was in bed for six months. And when he recovered, he sought to be elected speaker of the state legislature and lost. And then he ran for U.S. Congress, lost in a landslide. At age 37, he actually won a race to become U.S. representative, but lost his re-election bid two years later. Then he ran for the U.S. Senate and lost. Then he sought the vice presidential nomination at his party's national convention and got less than 90 votes. Then he ran for the U.S. Senate and lost again. Then in 1860, this consummate loser who said of himself, that he had a face that would stop a train, was elected president of the United States. For most of his life, the world looked at Abraham Lincoln and saw fifth grade Teddy Stoddard. But God saw something else, something worth loving, something worth guiding, something special, something worth 
dying for. For you see, God so loved this world, the people of this world, every last one of them, that he gave his only son, the man that we know as Jesus, to die on, for them on the cross, so that whosoever, whosoever you may, you may be, whether it's you, whether it's me, whether it's Abe Lincoln, whether it's Teddy Stoddard, so that whosoever believes in him shall not live a meaningless life, shall not die a meaningless death, but shall live and shall love with him right now and forever. Scripture tells us that God loves the Teddy Stoddards of the world. Perhaps we should give such love a try as well. With apologies to Ken Dutch, who is our official church mathematician, the world of numerology is a place that I seldom hang out. But in numerology, we are told that a zero is the equivalent of nothing, Zero is nil, nothing, naught. But if you take even the lowest of numbers with value, the number one, and put it alongside a zero on either side, you suddenly have a number of worth. So it goes with people. If you or I, or if all of us, stand by a person that this fallen world considers to be a zero, just like Mrs. Thompson stood by, Teddy, suddenly they become a person of worth. You know, this morning you may be aware of a, of a Teddy Stoddard in your office, in your neighborhood, in your family, in our church family, perhaps in the reflection you see when you look in the mirror. And the world may see that person as a zero, a person who is unpleasant, unlikable, and unteachable, as someone to disregard or to avoid. But the Lord God, the one who looks not upon their looks, but upon their heart, is ready and willing to stand beside them and to make them whole. On our best days, our best days, the Lord God uses the likes of us to make zeros into whole numbers. Why not make today one of your best days? I'm pretty sure there's a Teddy Stoddard somewhere near you. Why not show him or show her some Christ-like love, some Christ-like compassion, and remember what goes around comes around Love freely given has a way of coming home. And when you stop to think about it, that is the heart of the matter. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, sometimes we are just sort of bewildering in the way we reach out and treat other people. Lord God, we see what sometimes the world wants us to see, and that's not really who they are. Yet you, Lord God, look upon their, on their hearts. You see what is inside them. You see what makes them tick. You see where their loves are, where their passions are. You see where their commitments are. Lord God, this day we pray that as you look into our hearts, you would like what you might see. But we would also pray that we might be tempted this day to look upon others as, as you do, to try to get a glimpse of the heart rather than the outer shell, because that, Lord God, is what makes them unique, makes them different, and makes them worth dying for, even on the cross. Lord, we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.